Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I really appreciate uh, Women in Business inviting me, and I'm very excited to speak to an audience of young women. Uh, many have said that the hope of the world uh, depends on empowering uh, women to take uh, full partnership in our economy, and I think that's true. So I hope uh, many of you are inspired to uh, start your own beautiful businesses. So um, I named my book uh, Good Morning Beautiful Business because when I was running the White Dog Cafe for 26 years, I lived upstairs and I had a sign in my bedroom closet that I would see each morning when I opened the door that said, Good Morning Beautiful Business. And it was a reminder to me of just how beautiful business can be when we put our energy and our creativity and our time into producing a, a service or um, a product that our community needs. So it was a time in the morning when I would stop to reflect on my own business and thinking about how the farmers are out in the fields picking fresh <coughs> organic fruits and vegetables to bring into town that day. Uh, and I would think of the, the animals out in fresh air and, and pasture and our uh, goat herder, Dougie, who said that when she kissed her goat's ears, it made the cheese better. And I think that's probably true. So to me, uh, business is about relationships. Money is simply a tool. Business is about relationships with everybody that we buy from and sell to and work with, and about our relationship with Earth itself and all the other species who live here with us. So um, I wanted to um, start reading a, by reading a passage from the preface. And, I, um, and this sort of gives, gives an overview you know, uh, of the ideas in the book. This book is both a love story and a business book. It's about a love of life, nature, animals, community, and unique local culture. A love of good food and family farms, and a love of democracy. All being threatened by a global economic system driven by profit. It's also about a deep love of business and how we can embrace a way of doing business that is beautiful, that nurtures all that we cherish, and that furthers the creation of a whole new economic system based on caring relationships. Though this new economy is global in vision, my story and the story for each of us begins right at home, in our own community, and with our own capacity to recognize and protect what we truly care about. So uh, my first community was a small town in western Pennsylvania called Ingomar, uh, where I grew up north of Pittsburgh, and this was the busiest intersection in town because that's where the beer distributor was located. Uh, and it was in Ingomar that I witnessed the role that small business owners play in community life. I would go with my mom or my grandmother uh, to the butcher shop and the butcher would always say, well, how was that steak last Saturday night? Or how was that uh, turkey on Thanksgiving? Because the, the butcher knew the farm that it came from and wanted to know uh, how, how it was. Uh, so, uh, you know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick baker, these are the relationships that form the foundation for community life. Uh, so it was with that knowledge that, um, that I grew up. Um, so here was my first business. I moved to Philadelphia in 1970, and my first husband and I, my boyfriend from fifth grade, uh, started a store called the Free People Store. And uh, we started it with $3,000 because we had just returned from a, a tenure as uh, VISTA volunteers in Alaska, uh, and we were each given $1,500 as our stipend. So that's what we used to start the store. And we couldn't afford to rent an apartment and a storefront, so we slept in the back of the store. And we used our ingenuity, ingenuity to buy uh, things that we could sell for uh, a lot more. Um, in the beginning, actually, my, uh, my husband uh, and I were trying to figure out what we would do. And when I was a little kid, I often sold, uh, sold things. Uh, we were too much, too independent to actually work for anybody, so we decided we were going to start a business. And, and uh, I said, well, let's start a store because um, I know enough to know that um, all you have to do is to buy something at one price and sell it for a higher price. That's all there is to it. <laughs> That's about all we knew when we started the Free People Store. So we would do things like buy um, a, a long uh, white underwear and, and dye it uh, purple and pink or tie-dye or whatever. Uh, we'd buy it for like a dollar fifty, dye it and sell it for six dollars. Uh, here's a pair that I hung in the, in the doorway of the store where I opened the back flap and put open or, or close. Uh, so we, we did have enough money to buy normal store fixtures, so we went to a town on garbage day and in Chinatown we discovered that 
boxes, these wooden crates were put out on garbage day that were, had been used to ship goods from China to the United States. And we collected these boxes. My hobby as a child was building forts up in the woods, so I was very good with a hammer and nail. And I uh, arranged these uh, boxes and nailed them together and painted them primary colors. And as you can see, our uh, merchandise was kind of hip, hip, uh, hip merchandise. Um, back then in the, um, the 60s, we used to say that you can't trust anyone over 30. So we decided that we wouldn't sell to anyone over 30. Uh, so we selected things that our age group would like. It was, the concept was kind of a general store for the under 30 crowd. Uh, nowadays, it's kind of called a lifestyle store, where there's a mixture of clothes and records and books and um, housewares, um, you know, along with your jeans and t-shirts and whatnot. So, you know, we have dangly earrings and candles and baskets and frisbees and um, madness bedspreads and uh, Mexican glass, glassware and, and so on. Uh, we also had clothes. Here's a picture of me taking my picture in the mirror. Uh, I did these super graphics to uh, decorate the store. Uh, the center tables were these used uh, spools from the electric company. And you can see an old barrel there. Uh, so everything was reclaimed uh, that we found uh, for free. Uh, you can see sort of the 1960s style merchandise with the macrame belts and bell bottom jeans and t shirts and whatnot. And I'll read you a little passage from uh, this, this time of my life. buy our jeans from a big brand name company like Levi Strauss because we couldn't make the minimum order. All we could afford was to buy three pairs in three sizes from a lesser known brand. Once we splurged and bought three pairs of purple velvet bell bottom jeans, a big investment for us. They were the most expensive items in the store and we were eager to sell them so we could buy six more pairs, then 12, and so on. The purple velvet jeans led to something we hadn't yet thought about. One day when I was in the store alone, a group of 10 or 12 high school girls descended on the store all at once. I was trying desperately to keep my eyes on each of them as they asked me questions to draw me to different parts of the store. Suddenly, they all left as they had come at once. And I noticed with dismay as they hurried out the door that one of the girls was wearing a pair of the purple velvet jeans. Stop, they're my jeans, I cried out, and they took off running. I locked the door and gave chase. Up the street and around the corner we went, dodging traffic across a busy thoroughfare. I was gaining ground, and as the group reached the parking lot of the supermarket at the corner of 44th and Walnut, I lunged and tackled the culprit to the ground. Without thinking, I unzipped the jeans and yanked them off her. As she lay on the sidewalk under her pants screaming, I ran back to the store and triumphantly returned our purple velvet jeans to the shelf. I was determined that we would sell that pair and more and more and more until someday Levi Strauss and company would be very glad to sell to us. And indeed they were uh, because the store grew up to become uh, urban outfitters. Uh, and my uh, first husband is still the CEO uh, and, and board chair of Urban Outfitters. And um, a few years afterwards, they brought back the name uh, Free People, and uh, there are now a chain of Free People stores as well. Uh, but the, um, the concept of the, for Urban Outfit art store was the model for Urban Outfitters, not for Free People, which is just a clothing store. Um, but um, even though the store was doing well, about two years in, I decided that I needed to leave uh, the marriage, uh, which was not doing as well, and um, there were, you'll have to read the book to find out why. Uh, but I decided that it was time that I left my fifth grade boyfriend, and uh, I'll read a little chapter to write a book around, around that time. Dick's and my lives would take drastically different turns. He continued on to the Free People store, and I had no idea where life was leading when I packed my bags and left my husband home and business. I got only a block away when I ran a red light and collided with another car. Luckily, no one was hurt, but the car I was using could not be driven. A passerby offered to help me home. But I can't go home. I've just left my husband. My bags are packed, and I've got to keep going, I poured out as we stood on the sidewalk. And now I have to find a job fast, because I need money to repair the car. Maybe I can help, said the passerby, a very friendly, blonde, curly-haired young man about my age. I work in a restaurant called La Terrasse on the 3400 block of Sansom Street near the university, and they have an opening for a waitress. I'll take it, I said immediately, as if I were talking to the person who was hiring me. And so that's how I got into the restaurant business that would be my life for the next 40 years, quite by accident. <laughs> so, there's a picture of me at the time. 
Uh, and so I moved on to the uh, 3400 block of Sansa Street. Well, first I got the job there uh, as a waitress at La Terrasse. And uh, then I, I won't tell you, that's a whole chapter in the book of uh, La Terrasse days. And I uh, became the general manager and then a partner in the business. And then I left and started the white dog on the first floor of my house down the street. And I decided that this was the block where I wanted to live, where I wanted to start a business, raise my family. Uh, and I believe that that is the first step in building a sustainable local economy, to take responsibility for a place and get to know that place, become knowledgeable. Where does our food come from? Where does our water come from? Where does our energy come from? Where does our waste go to? Go to? Uh, and so I ended up living for 40 years um, on this block. This is a watercolor, it's probably 100 years old. <laughs> Doesn't quite look like this, but I fell in love with the Victorian brownstone uh, houses on Sansom Street. Um, here's a picture of the, of the front of the White Dog Cafe. I started just as a, a coffee and muffin takeout shop. Uh, we didn't even have any tables and chairs in the very beginning, and, and I lived upstairs uh, with my um, second husband and, and children. Uh, this is a picture of the original muffin shop. And uh, I didn't have enough money to put an exhaust system up through my house in order to put in a stove when it was time to expand the business, so I put a charcoal grill in the backyard. Um, and the, uh, the chef had to uh, cook outside. The waiters would come down the stairs and out to the grill and either back up or into the outdoor eating area. Uh, in the winter time, we made a plastic tent around the grill and the chef was out there with uh, parka and mittens and whatnot uh, and, 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 and made it through New Year's Eve and then quit. And I didn't have a, uh, the nerve to uh, put an ad in the paper and take the chef out back to show them the grill, so I waited I closed the restaurant and waited until spring to reopen. But um, anyway, going to, into too much detail. Uh, back in those days, um, we uh, had a uh, most popular area was the outdoor uh, uh, seat, seating area. And I would take my kids who were two and four at the time over to the Penn campus and hand out flyers uh, advertising the restaurant. And we'd run home and peek in the backyard to see if any customers had come. If you uh, needed to, uh, the, well, the, first of all, the dishwasher uh, was just a three bowl sink in the indoor dining room. So when you finished eating, you'd pass your dirty plates over to the dishwasher who would wash them while he uh, merrily talked with you. And uh, if you needed to use the restroom, you were directed up to our house where you would uh, uh, wave to my kids as you made your way to the family bathroom. Uh, so that's how we began. Uh, but we grew quickly and, and soon were able to build this addition uh, over the, the old outdoor uh, dining room. And it was a two level addition, so we increased our seating eventually to 200. Uh, and and uh, over time, uh, grew the restaurant to um, have about 100 employees, including part-timers, and grossed around $5 million a year. And I feel like our success really came from uh, focusing on our place and, and, and growing deeper in our place, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, so here's another important time in the uh, cafe, which was getting our liquor license. And I had, um, because that's how we were able to get funding to build the addition and our uh, real indoor kitchen and so on. Uh, and uh, I had had a beer called Anchor Steam when I was in San Francisco. Anyone ever have that beer? Uh, well, it was really uh, a, a great beer. It was the first time I had tried a, 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 a beer from a microbrewery. Nowadays, it's very commonplace. Uh, but when we got our liquor license back in 1985, um, it was very new. Uh, and I couldn't wait to start serving uh, this new kind of beer. I was finally able to begin serving the new American beers I was longing for. Customers were surprised when they came into the bar and ordered a popular beer like Heineken to be told that we didn't carry the brand. Then how about a long bra? No. Well, then I'll take a big load. Not that either. Then just give me a bud. Sorry. But how about one of these beers? Handing over our beer list, mighty short at the time, the bartender explained that the White Dog carried only beers from small, independent breweries, later called craft or microbrews, that brew beer in small batches. I soon discovered that unlike wine, Beer is best when fresh and without the preservatives needed for long distance shipping, just like local food. So I upped the ante. Not only did I want flavorful all American beer, I became determined to have beer that was local, fresh, and made without preservatives. So I was thrilled to hear in 1987 that an excellent new brewery had opened just 60 miles to the west in Adamstown. It was not only the first new brewery in Pennsylvania since Prohibition, but it was owned by a woman. I immediately called up the owner of Carol Stout, shown, shown here, and asked about ordering her beer. At first, Carol thought 60 miles was too far for her beer to travel. She was into local too. But I convinced her to sell to me. And she drove into town with a keg strapped into her passenger seat with a seat belt. 
We laughed about that years later when Carol was celebrating the 20th anniversary of Stout's Brewery after winning many gold medal at the Great American Beer Festival. It wasn't long before Stout's began brewing our private label beer in 22 ounce bottles. I named it Leg Lifter Lager and do this label for our beer. <laughs> so it was a very, very popular beer. Here are my kids, uh, Grace and Lawrence, uh, who were two and four when I opened uh, the White Dog. Uh, not recommended to start a business when you have little kids, but you know, it happens, <laughs> what can you do? Uh, but raising my kids uh, in the workplace, you know, living above the store in the old fashioned way of doing business, uh, just like the family farm or family inn or the corner store in the old days where families lived upstairs, uh, it helped me develop a different business perspective because I would see um, every day uh, the people uh, who uh, who, who was, were affected by the, my business decisions, whether it was my uh, employees or my customers, the parents of my children's friends, uh, the suppliers, the environment or whatever. There's a short distance between me as a business decision maker and those affected by my decisions, unlike most CEOs today who never see those affected. Uh, so there was um, also, I was more likely to make decisions uh, from the heart. Uh, oftentimes in business schools, students are told, you know, leave your values at home when you go to, to work. Uh, so there's a separation, a, a compartmentalization of our values. Uh, so at home, uh, we teach our kids the gold rule, but when we get to work, uh, gold rules. Uh, that he who has the gold makes the rules and makes the rules in, in, in favor um, of, uh, of them. Uh, so uh, this has ended up in a, in a lot of problems in our society, uh, rising inequality, uh, the destruction of our natural environment. Um, and so for me, um, making decisions more from the heart uh, came more naturally uh, when I was a part of my own community. And I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, the person on the, uh, on the right is Greg Coleman, who was a longtime dishwasher uh, at the White Dog Cafe. And uh, this picture was actually taken uh, in Havana, Cuba, because we had an international sister restaurant project where we took our staff and customers on delegations to visit countries that the US government was at odds with so that we could see firsthand what is the um, impact, what is the effect of our foreign policy on the lives of others. And of course, we've had an embargo against Cuba for uh, you know, 60 years, uh, something like that. Um, so um, we, that's why we went down there, and Greg was one on, uh, came on one of our trips. And uh, he decided he was going to go in the kitchen and help uh, the Cuban dishwasher wash dishes. And when I was looking at this picture, I said, you know, I know why Greg went in to help her. She's a pretty cute dishwasher. Uh, but anyway, I have Greg's picture here because I wanted to talk about the concept of paying a living wage. Uh, and I first heard about this, which was the um, voluntary commitment on the part of a business owner to pay not just the uh, legally required minimum wage, but the living wage. What does it cost to live in a particular community? And when I first heard about this, I had a kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Um, well, you know, that's great for other people's businesses, but it would never work in the restaurant business. You know, how can you pay uh, a living wage to entry-level dishwashers and prep people? And then one day I was down in the kitchen and, and Greg and a couple other dishwashers happened to look up at me at the same time. Uh, and all of a sudden the light bulb went off in my head. And I'm thinking, what have I been thinking about? Of course anyone who works full time at the white dog, I want them to be able to pay their rent and buy their clothes, their food, and so on. Of course they want to pay a, a living wage. Another example was um, my relationship with nature. Uh, I had heard about climate change and the white dog began to have programs on climate change in around 1998. I also knew that Pennsylvania was deregulated as California is um, the first two states to be deregulated so that we could actually sign up for renewable energy. But I hadn't been moved to do so, even though I knew intellectually uh, that I was able to do that until there was a drought in Pennsylvania. And I went up to the Poconos where I like to hike and saw how the drought was affecting the woods that I really love, uh, how the leaves were beginning to fall off the tops of the trees, even though it was early August. Uh, the big ferns on Fern Hill were all crinkled up like um, brown tissue paper on the forest floor. And as I walked along, there was just an eerie silence, just the crackling of the sticks and leaves, and not even the birds were singing. And there was just a, a, a sense of fear in the air, uh, fear of fire. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, um, this is what it's going to be like with climate change, uh, that parts of the world are going to have droughts and fires and other parts, storms and floods. and um, 
went over to a big oak tree and became a tree hugger. Put my arms around the oak tree and promised I would go back to Philadelphia and find out how to sign up for renewable energy. But I made that decision uh, not because I figured it out in my head, but because I felt it in my, in my heart. Uh, and there's a picture of the wind turbines in, in Pennsylvania Mountains. So another example was my relationship with community. I was driving past West Philadelphia High School one day, and I was stopped at a red light and was watching the students come out of the school. And I thought to myself, this is my local public high school, and I don't know these kids, because my own kids go to a private Quaker school. Uh, I want to know who these kids are. So I went in and talked to the principal, and we started a mentoring program uh, for, uh, for kids from uh, West Philadelphia High School. And this is a picture of the kids out on the farm. Uh, we took them around to show where our food comes from and, and uh, many other experiences. And they work part-time in as interns in the um, restaurant, the kitchen, the dining room, the office, and so on. And at the end of the year, we had a, an event called the Hip Hop, uh, where the kids put on a, uh, this outdoor dance and dinner with the help of our staff. And uh, about five years into the program, we did this for 15 years, this mentoring program. Um, about five years later, uh, the, the, the student in the blue hat, David, uh, we also gave a, a, a scholarship. And he had received one of our first scholarships to go to culinary school. And he came walking into the hip hop with his girlfriend. And I thought my eyes well off. I'm thinking, well, what's affected me? And all of a sudden, I realized that I finally knew the answer uh, that I was asking uh, way back when, uh, who are these kids? Uh, that uh, there are children, that all children are, are, are children, the children for all of our society. So, um, well, let me just pause there and say that um, th these are the different ways, the three ways, my relationship with employees, my relationship with nature, my relationship with um, my community that uh, affected the way I did business in, in various ways. So one of the things that the white dog was most known for was, uh, or continues to be, buying from local farmers. And this is a Mark and Judy Dorn strike from Branch Creek Farm that grew uh, organic uh, tomatoes and other vegetables for the white dog. And one time Mark said to me that um, successful farming is the balance of feminine energy with masculine energy, of nurturing with efficiency. Um, if you have too much efficiency uh, and not enough nurturing, you'll have a well-run farm, but you're not gonna have a good product. On the other hand, if you have too much nurturing without enough efficiency, you might have great tomatoes, but you're gonna go out of business because you're not using your time in a wise way. And it's that balance. Um, and so I started to think about our whole economy and how our economy is out of kilter, that there's much too much uh, masculine energy. And I'm not talking about gender here, but the energies that are in each of us individually, masculine and feminine energies, uh, that there's too much uh, focus on efficiency and not enough in nurturing. Uh, and nothing could be more clear than examples from uh, the industrial agriculture system, uh, such as the factory farming of animals. And here we have the battery cages of uh, these uh, hens, where we're uh, saying, uh, the, the, the uh, corporations are saying, like, how little uh, space uh, can we give these mother hens when there's three or four crammed to these little tiny cages? How little light and air? How little food and water? Um, all to get the cheapest uh, possible egg, the maximum amount of efficiency uh, with uh, no nurturing whatsoever. So of course at the White Dog we switched to all uh, pasture chicken and uh, eggs from un uncaged uh, hens. And then I heard about the, uh, the story of the factory farming of pork, which I thought was even more horrifying, that these um, mother pigs are kept in these cages so small uh, they cannot turn around, uh, lie down, um, take a step forward their entire lives. Uh, they're artificially inseminated, the baby's taken away prematurely, artificially inseminated again, as though they were pieces of equipment in a factory. But these are mammals, uh, like our dogs, like us, and all mammals uh, share the capacity for basic emotions uh, from despair to joy. Uh, th these are uh, intelligent animals, they say they have the same intelligence as a three-year-old child. Um, we, we know that uh, mammals have these emotions. We see them on the faces of our dogs, uh, the joy of going for a walk, the despair uh, when they lose a, a, a companion animal uh, or left at home or whatever, or the guilt if they steal a little piece of sausage off the, off the coffee table. Uh, we see these expressions. Uh, and so I was horrified to think uh, that these uh, sentient beings were kept in this cruel way, uh, that this was a 
a violation of nature to treat these mothers this way and really a betrayal of our trust uh, to care for farm animals. So I realized uh, that the pork that I was serving at the White Dog must come from the system because unless you know otherwise, something like 95% of pork in this country um, comes from this cruel and barbaric system. So I finally I just went into the kitchen and said, take all the pork off the menu. That we, you know, we can't serve uh, the, the pork chops, the, the ham, the bacon uh, from this cruel, uh, in supporting this cruel system. So um, we went about finding a farm where uh, the pigs were raised on pasture. Now here's a, a picture of one of our farms out in Lancaster County. And this is the way the pigs like to sleep. They like to sleep in pig piles. They're very social creatures. They like to roll in the mud and lie in the sun. Um, you know, just like uh, our dogs do. Uh, then I found out about the plight of the cow, how, how cows are herbivores, they're supposed to be out on pasture, um, and so they, uh, uh, because the, the farm bill makes grain so cheap, the farmers often take the uh, cows off of the pasture, um, and the, if it's beef cattle uh, put into stockyards, uh, if it's uh, dairy cattle often uh, left uh, in, in barns 24-7 uh, hooked to uh, milk, uh, milk machines. So uh, here's a, uh, so we, we switched to all grass-fed beef. That was uh, Dr. Bill Elkins from Branch Creek, from a, a Buck Run farm uh, with his Angus beef. Uh, here's a, a dairy uh, where the babies are kept with a mother, Mo almost, uh, you know, something like 99.5% dairy uh, business take the calves away as soon as they're born. I didn't know this for a long time, uh, but, we take the, we impregnate artificially impregnate the mother cow, and then when the baby's born, we take the baby away, uh, so that ba the baby never gets to drink its mother's milk, so that human adults can drink the milk meant for the baby. Uh, and to me, this is like a really perverse uh, uh, situation. And studies are starting to come out that milk is actually bad for us, uh, for for adults, um, and that it uh, does the opposite effect that women are told in particular uh, that it helps us build stronger bones. So anyway, we, we sought to find farms where babies uh, stay with mothers. This is um, Hawthorne Valley Farm uh, in the Hudson Valley. So um, oh, this is Dougie, uh, who, the one that kisses her goat's ears. Uh, and I finally got to the point where I looked at my menu and thought, we've finally done it. We have a cruelty-free menu that all of our animal products come from small family farms where the animals are treated humanely. Uh, this is going to be our market niche. This is our competitive advantage. Uh, this is all about us. Uh, and then I thought to myself, well, Judy, if you really do care about those pigs uh, and, and, and goats and cows and so on, if you really do care about the environment that's being polluted by the concentration of animals in these factories where all this manure uh, goes into the streams and kills the fish and so on, uh, if you care about the um, uh, small farmers being driven out of business, if you care about the consumers that are eating this meat that's full of antibiotics and hormones, uh, then rather than keeping this as your market niche, you'll share this information with your competitors. So that was my transformational moment that really changed my life ever since that time. Uh, and I realized that there is no such thing as one sustainable business, that we can only be part of a sustainable system, and that we have to work in cooperation in order to create that sustainable system. Uh, so I started um, a nonprofit and began putting 20% of my profits uh, into uh, my nonprofit uh, to uh, uh, publish a, a guide uh, of, uh, that listed all the farmers that the white dog bought from with a phone number and all their products and so on. I turned to farmer Glenn who was bringing us in two pigs a week. Um, we bought the whole animal, uh, learned how to use all the parts of the pig. Uh, this is actually a picture taken at the Dance of the Red Tomato. So I asked uh, Glenn if he wanted to expand his business to bring more, more pork into, um, into the, the city to increase the supply of farm products. And he said, yes. And I said, well, what's holding you back? And he said he needed $30,000 to buy a refrigerated truck so that he could deliver uh, to more restaurants. So I loaned the $30,000, and he bought the truck. Uh, and this is Fair Food, uh, the nonprofit that we started. Uh, the Fair Food is now, this was in 2000, so it's now 14 years old. And uh, about maybe about 10 years ago, we started the Fair Food Farm Stand at the Reading Terminal that now handles the products of, of uh, 100 different uh, farms and small food enterprises, uh, everything from you know chutneys and jams to ice cream and cheeses. And uh, Philadelphia now has their own crackers available at the farm stand, so we can have local cheese on local crackers, washed down with local beer. They have our own gin now, so we can have a local martini and so on. Um, so um, 
Another part about traditional business that uh, I don't like is the, the mantra of grow or die, that we have to keep growing our businesses larger and larger, and that we measure our success by how, how much we've materially grown. So a lot of people would say, well, how many, uh, how many white dogs do you have? And I'd say, well, just, just one. Uh, and people would say, well, start a restaurant in New York. I know a place where you could start it, or DC, or whatever. Um, but I realized that if I started a chain, like a national chain of some sort, that I would lose what was most valuable to me, and that was the authentic relationships I had with my staff and my suppliers, my customers, and so on. So instead of starting a white dog in someone else's community, I started a black cat uh, in my own community, uh, which is a retail store next door to the white dog, where we, we specialized in selling products that were locally made, uh, as well as fair trade. Uh, and here's a shot of the inside. Someone suggested that this looks like a grown-up free people store, you know, with the sort of uh, more finished boxes. <laughs> um, so I began to see that chains are like invasive species. Uh, they spread into other people's communities um, and smother out the indigenous businesses uh, that are struggling to survive and you know, spreading a brand across the country. Uh, so I started thinking, well, if, uh, if this is the negative way, how does nature grow? Uh, nature, of course, grows. Uh, how does nature grow? Well, nature grows deeper uh, in its own ecosystem. Uh, and so that's the way that we can also grow our businesses, to grow deeper in place. And as nature grows, uh, to become more complex, more diverse, and more adaptive to the actual needs of our own community, of our own ecosystem. And then I started thinking about how we could re reimagine growth, that we don't have to grow in a material way. We can grow by increasing our knowledge, by expanding our consciousness, by deepening our relationships, by developing our creativity, uh, by building community, and by having more fun. So these are the ways that I concentrated on at the, at the White Dog uh, to grow. Uh, we had table talks um, at uh, dinner or breakfast to talk about the issues of the day. Uh, here's Patch Adams, uh, the, the doctor who talks about uh, using humor as a, a way to heal people at one of our breakfast talks. We had storytelling, uh, giving voice to uh, underrepresented groups, um, whether it's recent immigrants or um, incarcerated uh, ex-offenders uh, telling tales from jails. Uh, and this photo is a, a, a storytelling of same-sex marriages as a gay couple and a lesbian couple uh, sharing their stories. We did community tours. Here's a, a tour of uh, inner city gardens uh, in North Philly. Uh, we did tours of prisons. This is an organic uh, garden at Greaterford Prison. We did affordable housing tours, many other tours, solar tours, and so on. We did uh, annual events. This is our annual Martin Luther King event, uh, our annual uh, Seder, a freedom, freedom Seder every spring. Uh, we also did a Native American Thanksgiving dinner, and so on. And we had lots of fun. Uh, we did these block parties out in the street, Noche Latina, Roman Reggae, uh, Bastille Day party, and, and this was one of my favorites, the Liberty and Justice for All Ball on the eve of uh, Fourth of July, where we had a buffet of farm fresh products, and then I did a little skit afterwards called Birth of the Nation, um, and that's the bed where I, I gave birth. I'll show you a little story here. So first, uh, out came a Revolutionary War fellow playing the drums. Uh, then I came out as a pregnant colonial woman, guided by my midwife, the beach ball under my uh, apron, and on my back I had a sign, George Washington slept here. <laughs> my midwife helped me into bed and then turned to the audience to yell, one, two, three, push, and everybody would yell, push, push, and I push, push my beach ball down uh, through a hidden hole under the covers, a uh, hole through the bottom of the bed, uh, so that my midwife could deliver my twins. Here comes the first twin, here comes the second one. One was called Liberty, the other Justice and they hopped on the stage to do a tap dance to Yankee Doodle Dandy. And then we uh, wheeled out the Statue of Liberty uh, and lit our sparklers and sang God Bless America. Uh, so all, these are all the different ways that we can have uh, fun in our own communities. And a lot of times people think that we have to uh, spend a lot of dollars, a lot of carbons to fly to some faraway place to have a good time, but we can actually have more fun in our own uh, communities and develop uh, more lasting relationships. So one of the most important experiences I had on our international sister restaurant um, program was to go to Chiapas, Mexico and establish a sister restaurant program there. Uh, and I wanted to understand why did the Zapatistas have their uprising on the day that NAFTA went into effect, January 1st, 1994. And in going down there, um, I discovered that 
The reason was because they predicted that when NAFTA lowered the borders, weakened the borders between Mexico and the United States, that uh, uh, corporate-grown corn would, be, would flood the market in Mexico, uh, subsidized uh, through the farm bill with our tax dollars to lower the price below the cost of production so that it would compete uh, and put out of business the indigenous corn farmers. And that's exactly what did happen. So it was really from um, the Zapatistas that I understood, uh, began to understand the importance of local self-reliance. That they had their revolution because they were demanding uh, that they continue to have local self-reliance, that they be able to sell their uh, corn in their domestic marketplace, in their own communities, um, not be forced into the global economy, uh, that they wanted to um, grow their own uh, product, their own you know, food to feed their own families and not have to buy it. Uh, they wanted to teach their children in their own languages with their own values. They wanted to maintain their own culture and not be sucked into the uh, corporate controlled global economy, the monoculture of Western lifestyle. They wanted to wear the same clothing that their women had been weaving for you know, hundreds if not thousands of years uh, and not be forced to work in the maquiladoras, the sweatshops along the border uh, with the United States to make cheap clothing uh, for export. So um, I you know, began to see that even though I came to Chiapas in the first place to support the, the local farmers in Chiapas, I began to see the relationship between what was happening to the farmers in Chiapas with the farmers in Pennsylvania. And here's Farmer Glenn with his, growing his corn. Uh, and how our small, small farmers uh, were being forced out by the large corporate farms uh, with unfair uh, subsidies to the, to the large farmers uh, rather than to the small family farmers. Uh, and that around the world, we were losing our local self-reliance, what the Zapatistas had had the revolution for, that we really need to join that revolution and demand our right to local self-reliance. Because in most communities, uh, we've lost our food security uh, we no longer um, uh, uh, depend on our region for food, but we depend rather on large multinational corporations who fly our food from other places in the world to deliver us our energy, our clothing, our building materials, um, so that we're no longer self-reliant in our basic needs that we need to, uh, to survive. So I started envisioning a, a, a new global economy, uh, a global network of sustainable local economies where uh, communities around the world would produce uh, basic needs locally uh, and then trade uh, in things that we don't need for survival. We would trade our excess um, uh, for uh, what we don't have locally, uh, whether it's coffee or bananas or whatever. And we would also trade uh, what our local uh, entrepreneurs uh, in innovate, you know, a, a special fashion or a special wine or cheese or a new invention or whatever. So it's not about not having global trade, but it's about having local self-reliance first and then trading uh, after that. So with that in mind, I, I created Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, which um, is in Canada and the United States. And basically, we connect leaders uh, in communities, about 80 different communities, um, uh, now in almost every single state and province uh, in Canada and the United States. So we connect the leaders. We spread the solution of, of how do we uh, build local economies, what works and what doesn't work. And we also drive investment. Uh, from the stock market uh, to our, our local entrepreneurs. So basically, our, um, what we focus on is the importance of local business ownership. Uh, it's the local business ownership, not just the retail stores, but the manufacturers, uh, where we really bring economic power back to our communities. And the retailers really give that um, unique character and identity uh, to our towns and cities. Uh, we're about uh, investing locally in our manufacturing sector. This is the Lopo from San Francisco made. Uh, and around the, the country now, uh, there's more and more communities realizing that we want to start doing our own manufacturing. Uh, and it's also about changing public policy to support local economies rather than supporting the, the large multinational corporations. And we're all about for prosperity for all. That at this time in history, as we transition from a corporate controlled global economy to a locally based a green economy that we want to make sure that uh, the, those who have been left out of ownership in the past uh, economy have uh, opportunity for ownership in this, in, in this new, new economy that we're building. Here's a picture of uh, our uh, retreat of our sustainable business network of Greater Philadelphia. That's our local Bali network. And I, I put this picture in because I, I want to make the point that uh, doing this work together uh, brings really collective joy. Um, you know, of, of working towards a shared vision for our community uh, and our local economy. I'll, I'll read the last passage here.
In working toward a better world, local living economies are shifting consciousness by modeling values of cooperation and sharing and demonstrating that our real security, as well as our happiness, lies in strong, self-reliant communities within a healthy web of life. By building a new global economy in which every community has food and water security and locally produced renewable energy, we are creating the foundation for world peace. We can reinvent what it is to be an American. Rather than a country of rugged individuals, we can be a country of rugged communities. Perhaps we always have been. So ultimately, we're, we're all members of uh, the community of life on Earth. Our industrial economy with so little connection to place and with so much efficiency and little nurturing has really greatly diminished the vibrancy of our web of life that we all depend on. When we understand that all life is interconnected, uh, we can feel our uh, connection uh, to the suffering pigs or the struggling farmers or the dying fish in polluted rivers. Nature creates the conditions for more life while our industrial economy is actually destroying life on Earth. So there's a real urgency, uh, a race against time to uh, stop climate change and environmental decline uh, to um, save our, our, our world uh, before it's damaged beyond compare, repair. So um, strategies and tactics uh, are really of secondary importance. The transformation of our economy from a life destroying to a life giving economy really begins in the heart. When I made the decision uh, to share my proprietary information, I was afraid. I was afraid of or that our sales would go down, that our profits would go down. Uh, and I didn't figure out in my head that it was the right thing to do. I made my decision because I love the pigs. Um, I felt it in my heart. So it was really my love of animals, of nature, of community uh, that was greater than my fear. When we love our places and take responsibility for them, when we open our hearts and lead with love, we can build a just and sustainable economy. And if we are going to succeed uh, in leaving a viable future for our children and for the children of all species, it will, will be because mankind has evolved you know, to take our rightful place in the web of life, not as exploiters, but as lovers. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> so we have any time for questions or? What are two questions? So if anyone has questions, you guys can step up to the mic. There's a mic over here, if anybody yeah, has a mic on both sides. Question. Judy will also be signing books during the networking session, so if you guys have questions then, that would also be a good time. Yeah, so no questions right now, so let's go on to the panel then. Uh, so I just want to say thanks again to Judy for her presentation. Uh, I found it really informative and engaging. Uh, I'm sure everyone else did. So now we're going to move on to the panel, like she said. Uh, I want to welcome to Creed, the director of the ICE Center at Villanova, and the rest of our panel to come to the stage. We'll get started with that. All right. Well, uh, my name is Tu Lusker, Tu Lusker number two, and I'm the director of the Center for Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship here at Villanova. I'm really honored to be a part of this program, part of this event, and uh, excited to have this group of panelists with us today. Having someone Skyped in, it feels very 2014 up here. Uh, so excited to have some questions come on from uh, students. If you guys, when you checked in, when you received up at the uh, check-in table, your packet of information has bios for all of our panelists in there, but there's also a sheet that you should have received about how to text in questions. So if any of you have something on your mind that you want one of our panelists to address, you can text in that question and that will uh, also magically appear on my iPad up here so I can relay those questions uh, to our panelists. But I thought we should start with a quick introduction from each one of our uh, members of the panel. And keeping in mind that the students do have your bios that were in the packet, maybe share something um, unique about your innovation and entrepreneurship experience and then uh, something maybe that you wouldn't necessarily put in a panel or put in a bio, but would be something interesting for them to approach you and talk about it ever. Tough one. Oh. <laughs> so whoever wants to start, we can start at the end here. Okay. Should I grab the mic? Yeah, I would pull the microphones closer there to make sure people can hear in the back. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Cordy Reed and I graduated from Villanova in 2010 and I started a business with my sisters who are in the front row, Melissa and Ashley, and um, I was a major in communications and elementary education and they were finance and mathematics. Um, so you can see we're a pretty diverse group and our business is called Turquoise and some of you may already know about our business because I may have followed you on Instagram. Um, so that's one of our marketing strategies to get our name out there. And um, I'm an artist now, so I use my artistic designs on technology devices like cell phones, tablets, laptops. And um, I started with my personal designs and then with my love of Villanova, I just thought it was very fitting to create Villanova designs. And when I was here, there weren't technology um, like cell phone, tablet, laptop, like Villanova designs. So I thought that was um, something neat to offer to students and alumni. And um, we went through a rigorous licensing process to be able to use the Villanova logos. And um, now we are working with the annual fund and donating a portion of our proceeds back to the university. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much an overview of Turquoise. Hello, good evening. My name is Beth Mooney, and my daughter will be ordering her first phone case from Turquoise this evening. She has a couple of product questions to ask. She's very excited. I started off of my first job as Assistant Director of Leadership Development and Greek Affairs at Villanova University. So very near and dear to my heart. And our programs um, have taken off thank you to the Villanova Women in Business Society. So again, very near and dear to our heart. Something that um, I may not have written in my bio, but I think is a good piece of advice as an entrepreneur, is I personally love power tools. I got a power sander and a power washer for Mother's Day. Um, and I don't know about Judy or the other panelists, but it's really good to take on a hobby where you can exercise your creativity, your frustration, your lock and cap with a power sander, um, and develop a hobby at the same time you develop a business idea. Because you can um, come up with a lot of good ideas when you're working through Again, a side thing that you enjoy. So again, welcome and thanks for coming. Okay, um, my name is Katherine Kinraid. I am probably one of the only panelists who is not an entrepreneur. I work for O'Brien and Gear, which is a um, environmental consulting firm um, slash engineering consulting firm um, based in Syracuse, New York, but we also have an office here. Um, so why I'm here is I'm here to talk about entrepreneurship and I run our corporate innovation program um, for the company. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, I guess something I didn't put in my, in my uh, bio, I'm getting married to Villanova in February, in, sorry, September of next year, so I'm super excited. Um, you know, really excited to be here and uh, thanks again. Hi. I'm Gigi Fergus, and uh, so I guess the one thing it's in here, but I just want to draw attention to it. I live in Wichita, Kansas, uh, and this is very difficult, but to try to follow along. So today I flew from West Virginia. I work nationwide, and I fly almost every single weekend. So that's a little something about me uh, as a million mile flyer. So <laughs> I'm sure we can find things to talk about with travel. Um, by training, I'm a nurse, and I've been a nurse for <coughs> probably longer than most of you have been alive in this room. And I went back to school after being off for 15 years uh, and got my MBA here at Villanova. At the time that I was working on my MBA, I was working in San Francisco, flying every other weekend from San Francisco to Philadelphia to go to the uh, executive MBA program. Opposite weekends, I flew San Francisco to Wichita, and on special weekends, I did the multi-city from San Fran to Philly to Wichita to back to San Fran, and I did that for two years. And I lived on East Coast time on the West Coast. What I do now is I do transformations and turnaround culture change in hospitals. Uh, I speak nurse, I speak clinical, and I speak financial, I speak business. So it's an interesting blend of the two, and uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight. All right, so now, Amy, we're going to give you a whirl on the... Uh... Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. 
Um, I'm Amy Heller, and I'm speaking in from Manhattan, New York, where I live. Um, I am part of the Villanova Business by Chase um, Advisory Committee, and I'm honored to be here today. Um, I can't see the other panelists, but their uh, background sounds very cool and interesting. Um, I'm sure in my packet it says that I founded W. World Inc., and um, it's a nonprofit. Um, membership based organization for women uh, to give back to the Spanish women and children um, in local communities throughout the country and in London. Uh, something that is not in my packet and you could talk to me about if I was there uh, would be um, that I think a lot of people coming out of school can be overwhelmed with um, how to get started on something on their own, and I think that. There is no clear roadmap, but some of the best advice that I ever got was to just start. And if your intention is good and um, you surround yourself with smart people, you learn as you go. And most of us are learning as we go, and you keep learning and keep going. Um, so that would be the advice that I would, I would give. All right, great. Uh, thank you, panelists, for your quick introductions there. We're already getting a number of questions being texted in, which is exciting. So we're going to fire right through these. Um, so we can try to get to as many of these as possible, but please do continue to send in your questions. So for Beth, uh, through learning to lead, you work closely with young women on their leadership skills. Can you speak to the importance of introducing entrepreneurship concepts to girls and young women early in their education? Absolutely, that's a great question. In fact, the Wall Street Journal had an article this week, if you saw it, about entrepreneurship in colleges. When we ask girls before our programs start, on average, how much do you think in high school you or your friends spend thinking about your parents? And I don't know if there's any guesses from the audience about what you think a high school girl thinks she or her peers spend on average day thinking about their parents. And I thought, okay, maybe it would be about 50%. Any takers? Our average, and we've um, interacted with over 4,000 girls since we began, I've got to the chance to be with 4,000 girls, 92% of their day they think they spend focusing on appearance. So if we, through our Girls Take Charge program, can shift all of that time and energy they spend on that to being productive about a dreaming of a business idea, um, you know, using, as so we talk about collaboration instead of competition, just think of the incredible businesses like Judy's that can be built when that energy is spent doing something productive. So growing their confidence, telling them their ideas are beautiful and wonderful, and having them see each other as support, there's so much, and it's so important that we do it at a young age. And we're about to start our first entrepreneurship program in a Pennsylvania school district specific to girls. So we're really excited to add that as an after school program. Great, thank you. Uh, here's a question for Courtney. So you founded your venture with your family members, with your sisters that you pointed out earlier. Are there scenarios or situations that you avoid in order to separate family from business? Could you say the last part of the question? Are there scenarios or scenarios. situations that you avoid in order to separate family from business? It's a good question. I never thought about that before. Um, well, since we all live together, I would say a lot of the business and family is intertwined. We don't really have set business meetings. They just kind of happen, um, which sometimes I'm not sure if that's the best or not. But again, a business is a creative entity in itself, so you can't always plan when things are going to come up and when they're going to happen. Um, but I would say for sure we sometimes have to separate, like, okay, this is my sister and we have to just do business because you know deeper feelings can get involved or you could be upset with someone or you know but we move past that um, and we all realize we each bring a different um, talent and skill and we all wear a different hat so we know to step back if someone's um, talking about their their part of the business but um, we make sure to keep challenging each other as well too that's important to always um, challenge each other so you can move ahead and change and grow, so. Great, thank you. So here's a question for, for Amy. How do you expand as a social venture to meet the needs of the population you serve, and do you view that expansion the same way that a for-profit business would? Um, the same as a for-profit, I missed the last part. Do you view that expansion the same way that a for-profit venture would? Yeah, you know, uh, that was one of the, the, the the early things I learned, and it, and it was it was interesting to try.
try to um, educate the girls that I was working with, or the women that I was working with, about that too. That a nonprofit is not a company that does not make money. It's a company that makes money and operates just like a business. Just you're not in the business of making your shareholders wealthy. You're in the business of making money for others. Um, I do think that in terms of expansion, it was very similar. Um, you can't fight off more than you can chew. Sometimes you get really excited and things start to, you know, go ahead and they require structure and framework and timing. Um, and so I would say my background for, in, in for-profit business and banking definitely prepared me um, to, to kind of roll out um, my own company. And, and structure it similarly. Great, thank you. A uh, question for Catherine. Do innovation programs like yours provide any unique outlets for women in the corporate world? If the answer is yes, is that intentional or unintentional? Okay, so I, I work for an engineering um, consulting firm where um, women are not um, a predominant entity. So um, I think one of the best things about our innovation program is that ideas don't have agenda. Um, we don't really separate and we haven't done too many studies on um, the outlets for women in particular, but because ideas are gender neutral, um, we found that um, it really is an opportunity for everybody to kind of get past that bias um, and, and share their thoughts with us. Um, another, another thing to note is that um, studies have found that entrepreneurship um, really has no bias towards a male or a female dominated um, society. So really, um, entrepreneurship is um, an opportunity for both male and female um, to kind of come together and problem solve. And we found actually at our company, um, again, predominantly male. Um, but the diversity of thought is, is really critical to um, engaging in an innovation program and seeing um, the, the teams and the ideas um, succeed. So I would, I would say that would be my response. So when you were mentioning the entrepreneurship and the venture, another question came in here. Do you see that entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, do you see that coming out of your, your daily life within the corporation into sort of your more personal life? Uh, I think definitely. I think um, that way of thinking, um, with whether you're an entrepreneur or you're an entrepreneur, um, or you're just somebody, um, you know, at home working, um, I think every component of it is critical to who you are. Um, that creativity, that innovative thinking, um, you really need creativity to kind of spark an idea. Um, you need the innovation to kind of have the um, the va try and put the value behind your idea, and then you need that entrepreneurship mindset to kind of put it into action. So, um, yeah, I would say it's definitely um, a part of my everyday life. Um, I just bought a house, so I'm constantly thinking of how to innovate or how to get that couch into my uh, my house because it really doesn't look like it's going to fit. Um, but I think I think it's constantly a part of who I am as a person, um, who my company is trying to become as a company of 900, um, and also part of the community at large, as uh, we saw with Judy's uh, company, White Dog. So. Great, thank you. A uh, question for Gigi. Are you seeing an increase in leadership opportunities for women in healthcare? And what can we do as students to better prepare for the obstacles we will encounter in healthcare? Well, I have some mixed feelings about that. Um, there are more opportunities and it really is about d distinguishing yourself in your field. You know, this kind of goes back to not just having, having a raw skill set but also having a good business head and I kind of like how Judy referenced around both the male and female pieces of it, the nurturing part as well as the efficiencies. Uh, in healthcare specific and, and what we're seeing are more and more women moving into CEO roles, uh, more nurses and, and more clinical pe people taking on more intrapreneurial type positions within facilities, like a, a, a department director who is growing a, a service line. Um, that being said, and I told you I started this comment by saying I'm a little torn, just 
less than a month ago, I was in a conversation uh, with a facility, with a company, around being a CEO. And with a, the in person who was interviewing me, uh, the male who was interviewing me, was quick to point out that I'm female. So I tell you I'm torn, because if you think that <laughs> things are changing, I like to think, yes, there are more opportunities, but yeah, there still are, are some challenges out there you have to overcome. And, my response to him was, well, I guess I must show up as an anomaly in your world. So, uh, you know, it's not going to stop me from continuing to move forward. Um, it, the opportunity is what you make of it. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Um, so please continue to text in questions. We do have a number of good questions coming here, but uh, panelists are eager to answer your questions, students. So uh, I, I do have questions that I've prepared, but I'm, I'm sure they're much more interested in what you all are wondering, what's in your mind versus mine. Uh, but we can get to some of my questions in a little bit if uh, you guys are stalling. So feel free, please do send in your questions. Uh, question for Amy, then. Yeah. Um, question coming in. If, if you could go through Villanova again, what would you do differently? Uh -huh. um, I could go through Villanova again. Well, I was just back on campus for the first time in like many, many years, a couple weeks ago for the Business Leaders Forum. And uh, it was really a, quite an interesting thing to, to stand in the place where I made decisions. I actually remember where I was standing when I decided to transfer to the business school. Um, I was a poli sci major and I thought I was going to be a student. Um, and it was nice to reflect on that decision and know that I, I in my heart, had made the right choice. Um, I would probably seek out for opportunities to do things like what you guys in the audience are doing today. Um, I don't know how many of those types of opportunities, we didn't have anything that was female specific. Um, you know, or gender specific in terms of business, etc. Um, but we did have programs and, and, and opportunities to kind of find out what was going to be beyond the, the four years. And I think now more than ever, um, Villanova is trying to incorporate more of that, what your real world experience is going to be when you get out. So I would say if I had to do it over again from a, from a future standpoint, I would have probably been more um, uh, taking more advantage of the, the opportunities to sit and learn from people who were on the other side of things already. Two, I have an yeah. answer to that as well. Okay, yeah, jump in. <laughs> um, not to butt in, but I think, um, not to plug the ICE Center, but I'm going to do that. Um, <laughs> the, the Center um, for Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship is a phenomenal um, experience that I would absolutely take advantage of. Um, I'm one of those people who came in as a biologist and always toyed with the idea of maybe doing business, but I wasn't really sure. My dad was in pharma. I, I, they wanted me to become a doctor. I didn't do that. Um, but I never thought of myself as entrepreneurial. I still um, struggle when I'm running the innovation program. I'm like, I'm not the one with the ideas. Um, <laughs> But I think uh, the facility like the ICE Center and the ability to just network and think of yourself as an innovator, um, utilize those creative juices that you have, um, think of yourself as an entrepreneur, I think that is a phenomenal experience and I would absolutely try and take, take challenge yourself to engage in those, in those programs, the business programs. Um, so I would, I would definitely take uh, take on the ICE Center and take on two. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, I appreciate the, the endorsement there. I'll, I'll add to that since we're doing a little ICE Center commercial here. On the, the URL for the ICE Center is on your text in sheet, so VillanovaICE.com. We do have a number of programs and activities that we would love to have you participate in if you're interested in, in them. And a fun fact about ICE Center programs is that 60% of our participants are women. So you're in good company and we'd love to have you uh, all join us and participate in some of those programs down the line. To, to, I just wanted to add, the one thing that, that I think is really important for you to hear is that this is a safe haven and that this is your opportunity. You're in a safe environment to practice, to try things out, to run things uh, up against your professors, other people in your groups. This is a safe haven and that was one of the things I did when I was in the executive MBA program is I actually took the concept around memorable care and I presented it 
to both nursing and business leaders while I was in the program. So I really, you know, to build off that, you have a medium through the Eye Center to do that. This is a great safe haven for you to begin that business. And I wanted to add, it's never too early to start networking and sharing your ideas. Um, because just by saying one comment may lead to someone saying, oh my gosh, like I know this person here, or they work for this company in this place, and just sparking that conversation can lead to so much more. So start now, and then, you know, even at, when you leave here, continue that. Great. Um, if there are questions that you guys want to respond to, either it's not directed towards you, I'd love to you. <laughs> As I just really so bought it in. Please continue to do that. <laughs> Uh, a question for Beth. So how do values drive decisions in the role of businesses to act as an agent of change, particularly within your venture? That's a great question. It really goes back to why do you want to start your own business? And I started learning to lead um, almost 10 years ago because what I wanted to do wasn't there. I wanted to be present for my children. I wanted to be a change agent. I wanted students to feel empowered to make a difference in their local communities. And that opportunity didn't exist, so I had to make it. And I know what we do at Learning to Lead, we can make a student want to go out there and again, make their school a better environment, make their community a better environment, but it needs to go back to what you value and what you want to get out of your business. And you know, starting a nonprofit and sustaining one during the Great Recession probably wasn't the most brilliant idea, so I have to remind you <laughs> next time, do a for-profit, please, Beth. Um, but when you go, when you're value driven yourself, and you just keep remembering what your mission is, you know, like Judy had her strong mission, and she was going to help the community and the people and her workers, and you just keep remembering what you're there for, it, I think it makes it so much easier to continue that drive. And on that piece too, you know, there'll be lots of um, brick walls in your way. I've encountered my share, and I'm sure you all have some comments about that too. But you just gotta keep finding a way to get through it. And I think that would be a topic I would definitely wanna make sure that we, that concept of resiliency and just find a way has helped out a lot. Great, uh, here's a question for Courtney. This is somewhat related to Catherine's response a minute ago. Um, how do you recommend that a student not in the business school approach the business world? That's a really great question. Um, I was really lucky, obviously, to have sisters who were in the business school. Um, but again, you don't have to major in business to be an entrepreneur. I mean, it's a passion in anything in life. Um, and I'm even finding myself to be learning business principles, probably some of the things you're learning in the business school. Um, so, like people say, it's not really just about what you're learning in the classroom, but in the real world. Um, so, yeah. Great. A question here for Gigi. You've worked with teams and students as a part of the Villanova Student Entrepreneurship Competition. What does it mean to, be, to you to be a mentor? So, one of the things we don't do well in most businesses is mentor, nurture, coach, and love each other into becoming that next leader. Sometimes we assume that, that, that they just come preloaded with that. So working with the VSEC program as a mentor, sometimes we can help those student groups look at their design, their product, their solution a little bit differently. Uh, the, the goal is not to chastise or to belittle, it's to help expand their thought process What's it going to take to bring this to fruition? You know, as an investor, as someone who is looking uh, at your product or at your service, as a potential user of that service or product, what do we need to hear to make us flip over and say yes, you know, to go from no to yes? So part of that VSEC relationship is working with them, mentoring them around presentation, around confidence, helping them figure out, hone down what their passion is. Uh, it's something I, I really enjoy with the VSEC program. So. Great, thank you. Uh, another question here for Amy. So mm -hmm. what were the most valuable lessons that you learned while working on Wall Street, and how have you used them to get where you are today? Um, okay, so I learned a lot um, um, in my uh, early years there. Um, 
it was predominantly, and still is predominantly male, um, but I learned very quickly that uh, you kind of just put that aside. Um, my personality is always pretty tough, so um, I, I have a pretty thick skin, and, and it probably got a little bit thicker uh, during my time there. Um, but I learned to use my femininity to my advantage from the standpoint that I could step back from things and offer a different perspective. Um, and I was always very quick to add my voice into conversations and things about change because um, I wanted people to get used to, to hearing it. I was fortunate to um, work with a lot of um, very bright and motivated women as I rose up. And, um, and they were all, I would say they all shared a common uh, theme, which was that they were not afraid to make their voices heard. And I think that was probably one of the most important things that I learned early on. I also learned that um, you can spend a lot of your time making money, um, and you can feel really good about that if that's what you value. Um, or you can spend all of your time making um, art, and if that's what you value, then that's really important. And you can spend all of your time doing stuff for other people, and if that's what's important to you, and that's what you value, then that's what becomes most important. For me, it was um, a combination and a realization of the fact that I was working at a very successful bank, and several banks actually, and it wasn't innately fulfilling to me. Um, but what I had learned from doing it could be applied um, to, to making a, a more fulfilling life for myself. So I would say I definitely learned a lot about business structure, a lot about being a woman and having my voice be heard um, in a non-traditional environment, and um, a lot about really just going for it because um, in the end, like if you don't try, um, you'll, you'll never know. So, that's what I would say. Great, thank you. Uh, another question here for, for Beth. Uh, can you talk about a time something in your venture did not go as planned, and what did you learn from that? Oh, lots. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, ironically, on a campus that's all near and dear to our heart, an immediate example comes to mind. We run summer programs, and I'll tell you two quick stories. So the first time I started learning to lead, I thought, oh, I'll just run a week summer camp and I'll teach kids leadership skills and then they'll want to go change their communities. So I you know, knocked on doors and I set up this camp and I got a phone call from this one woman and she said, I would really like to send my son to your camp. I said, great. And she said, now you have overnight housing, right? Because he's from El Salvador. And I was just gonna have a day camp. I'm like, of course we have overnight housing, you know? And then called up Villanova Conference Services, you have overnight housing for us, right? So you learn things along the way and don't say no, just kind of explore it first. But we had a situation where we were raising money for a um, pediatric cancer organization on campus. And it was for with our girls' summer camp. And a funeral was just letting out at the Villanova Chapel. And some adults were coming from the funeral and had partaken in some activities prior to the funeral, and they were um, putting their arms around the girls of our camp and making our girls feel uncomfortable. So here we are teaching the girls to be self-confident and go out there and make change in their community as a funeral is getting let out from the um, building of a chapel, and it was just not one of those wonderful situations, and I ended up um, down at the Radnor Police Station with the girls and um, they were filing complaints and you know you had in your head this great wonderful beautiful day of teaching girls independence and it ended up got going the way we wanted it to but it was a great teaching moment and it went, um, made me definitely pay attention more to details and the next time out we kept doing the fundraisers you know we just had more staff you know around and present and it was out of anybody's control and those things happen and you just learn from them and you don't let it stop you. <laughs> Does anybody else want to comment on that question uh, about something that didn't go as planned in your venture? Well, well yeah, this kind of connects and it's something from earlier too I was thinking about. Um, you're, there's no manual to be an entrepreneur or pursue your passion. You get led one way, you may get to a dead end, but then you go another way and you get led somewhere. So again, it kind of goes back to my whole 
talking to anybody and just starting a question, sparking a conversation. Because sometimes like when I wouldn't know what to do, I'd call um, a company up and they'd be like, oh, well, we don't provide that service, but maybe you should try this. Then I'd call someone else. They weren't the right person either. They'd give me someone. So it's really just about connecting the dots yourself. There's no boss to tell you what to do, who to call, where to call, when to call. That's everything you need to um, pursue on your own. Um, so just keep that in mind. But it's also a really nice freedom to have as well. So don't look at it as something fearful. It's a really, really neat freedom and you'll learn along the way. I definitely agree with that. Sorry, too. I didn't want to interrupt. I just no, want please. to say that I, I also to, to young women that are going through it, if you're not failing, you're also not succeeding. So if you are not taking those risks and taking the chances or knowing if you're going into something and you're afraid that you're going to hear no or you're afraid that you don't know what you're doing, or that by not doing that, you're not going to be able to succeed. And sometimes the answer is going to be no, and sometimes that door is going to be closed, but it's just a pivot point. It's not, and um, so yeah, it takes, a, it, takes, it takes doing the wrong thing sometimes to get farther along the path of going the right way. Great. So somewhat related to this to Gigi's comment about safe havens and sort of the, the ups and downs, things that don't always go as planned. Uh, the safe and traditional route, right, is go and get a nice corporate job and then maybe down the line start a venture. But Courtney, you started your venture right out of school. The question came in, you know, was that something you always wanted to start your own business or how did you make that decision? Uh, like where did you get the confidence to make that choice? Well, um, I, I'm very close with my family. Um, so we always did entrepreneurial things like we would give tennis lessons because we all play tennis at the university and um, my sisters have tutored a lot and um, you know we used to go around to doors and sell like little books we made when we were younger and you know just fun stuff like that so um, growing up I definitely say we had an entrepreneurial spirit but um, coming out of college uh, then we all went on to pursue our graduate um, degrees and then we um, finished those around the same time and we were kind of at this opening like where do we go from here and we were like we don't really want to separate and go get a corporate job you know in different states and so we came up with this idea and I had such a passion for art um, which was actually really unique how I came about that um, since I was a liberal arts major here I had to take one fine arts requirement and I took a watercolor course and by the end of that I fell in love with it took classes over the summer which led me to graduate school for art um, so when I graduated from grad school, I was like, I want to do art. And of course, everyone's like, how can you become an artist at you know 20 something? But um, fortunately, I had my sisters and um, you know, there was risk and there was fear. And some days you go to bed and you know, things did not go your way. You didn't get the right phone calls or you didn't figure anything out, but don't give up because then there's amazing days where you go to bed feeling so good, like, oh, I accomplished this and this and this today. So I would have to say it was definitely scary, and it still is because we're only, you know, about a year into our business. But, um, you know, we've been so fortunate along the way. Like, every time something clicks, something works, I'm like, this is why I'm doing it. So, yeah. Great. A question here for, for Gigi. You talk about your MBA program, you have a degree there that's in an academic discipline that's dominated by men. You also have a BSN degree, which is a discipline that's dominated by women. How do you take advantage of the unique combination of those two disciplines? So, uh, like I referenced at the beginning, I speak nurses, I speak clinical, um, and uh, CFOs love to chat with me because I can speak MBA-ish also. I can speak in accounting terms and I understand PE ratios and uh, the difference between a for-profit hospital and a not-for-profit hospital. Uh, and, you know, both of those degrees, uh, I think, kind of lend themselves to each other, believe it or not. Uh, one maybe softens the other. Uh, as a nurse, I've been a clinical nurse at the bedside before, uh, and I found that I had a bigger vision than just staying at the bedside and started doing intrapreneurial things in the hospital and starting Six Sigma programs and 
working within the hospitals to do things and started looking at the statistics of it, the dollar cost averaging, the savings, uh, looking at Six Sigma and lean programs. So the, the managerial efficiency piece kind of balanced out with the nurturing person at the bedside. Uh, even today, uh, actually I should say yesterday, we do multidisciplinary rounds three times a, a week in the start, starting in the ICU and uh, my staff is sometimes really surprised when they see me with patients because they know me and as a chief nursing officer they don't always they see me as a business person in the office a lot they don't always see that ca compassionate caring person that kills me because that's really the heart and soul of what I do is create memorable outcomes for patients um, I don't deal in commodity, I deal in human lives. So the two, MBA and BSN, I kind of see them as opposites, but compatible. It's a, it's a good synergy. Great, uh, here's a question for Catherine. So as a student who's interested in being entrepreneurial within a corporate setting, aside from formal programs like you all have at O'Brien here, is there a particular culture or something that students should look at that will help them uncover and know that this is a place, the corporation that they're entering is a place that they can be an entrepreneur in. That's a, that's a tough question, because um, I'm trying to grow the culture out of running here, so uh, when you find that out, let me know. Um, but I, I would say when you go to an interview, um, when you start to, to, to be in conversations with companies, um, look for problem solvers. Um, I think that's really the way of the future in any organization. I know it's a pretty general statement, but I think um, companies are tending to, to look for new ways, new creative ways of solving problems. Um, I, I guess also another thing, look for what their mission is um, as a company and what they're passionate about because you can't be an entrepreneur in a company if you don't uh, truly believe in their mission. Um, with O'Brien and Gear, one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about running our innovation program and helping to make sure that we're a sustainable company and, and we'll be able to push forward um, is because I truly believe in, in what we're doing um, as environmental consultants, as engineers, as scientists, um, you know, in our engineering fields, um, especially environmental consulting, um, you know, we are, we are working to clean up the, the natural environment. Our water um, groups are, you know, making wastewater treatment systems to help clean um, the, the water that, um, that we are drinking. Uh, same thing with our energy practice. We're looking at alternative energy sources. So for me, that's truly, it's about having that passion within that company. Um, so look for that when you're, when you're going to a company because you won't be able to get anywhere um, in a company if you don't truly believe in, in the company itself. So I would say look to be a problem solver, look to be creative, and look to have a aligned passion. I would just add on to that too. On your resume, I hire and fire a lot of people a lot. And one of the things that drives me crazy is at the top of the resume is to see an objective line. I know what your objective is. Your objective is to get a job. I don't want to read your objective. I want to read your vision. So put a summary statement, you know, fast track junior executive looking for the next big break. You know, I, I like to see your vision. Are you a big thinker? Are you, do you have a, a niche area that you are strong in? I, I know what your objective is. So along with that, you know, make sure that you're obviously that your vision and your mission align with whatever company you're going to. But again, just make sure your resume also reflects that. Um, I would also add to uh, the question the looking at companies that um, are more startup and younger based companies. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in those companies because they haven't been doing the same thing for a really long time, so they're more open to innovative thinking. They also have opportunities because you might not be as well-funded or as experienced, um, where you'll go in and be able to take on a much larger role at a much younger level. Um, you'll be able to gain a lot of experience because the truth of the matter is they don't have anybody else doing what it is that you're doing for them. So if, you know, when you're young, it's a great time to take risks in terms of 
what you're looking at in terms of your career. Um, if you're not exactly sure what you want to go into, um, you know, take a look at some of these, these younger companies that, that offer that flexibility inherently and can use young, smart minds um, in, a, in a multitude of ways. That way you can kind of start to create your own path in, in one of those things. Great. Yeah, here's a question for, for Beth. What has been the hardest part of being a woman entrepreneur? That's a great question. I know this probably doesn't relate to you yet, but it's the passion of wanting to be a really good mom and sibling. And I luckily had the support of my family in starting the business as well. And I think it would relate to anybody. It's that pull. And as women, I think we want to do everything to the best that we can. And that perfectionist side of us comes through. And so I think whether you have children or not, you know, just wanting to do 100% or 110% all the time right. is, I think, a common theme that we all face. And I think that's especially hard as an entrepreneur because your boss doesn't say go home. There is no two weeks vacation. I don't remember the last time God, in the 10 years that we, I ever took more than a couple of days, right. you know? So, I think no matter where you are, it's just that desire to want to do better and succeed. So I think that's the hardest part. Yeah. And, and I'll just add to that. Uh, for me, I was the mom who wasn't always at home and uh, always on the road, uh, working nationwide. So I'm always on speed dial with my children. I don't apologize for answering their calls. I had to have, we were using Skype and things like this way before it became Vogue because that gave us an opportunity to make sure that our relationship was strong. I'm very fortunate that my children are grown and uh, that we, we all are on texting, Facebook, phones. We innovated around what our need was to make sure that each person in the relationship got what they needed. Um, it is what it is sometimes. You, you have to try to balance everything. And just one more thing on that. I think, you know, having grown up Catholic and worked here and gone to some Catholic schools, that God truly gives you what you can handle and having that immense amount of faith. I remember I, my youngest child is redhead, I don't know why, curly hair, she had <laughs> ponytails, and I took her to school one day to pick up my other children, and the principal came forward, and it was a very, very busy time in our nonprofit business. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of just three hours of sleep at night. And the principal said, Beth, we need a PTO president. Will you please be the PTO president? And I was like, oh, I cannot. And my little four-year-old at the time said, Mommy, you said any girl can be president, right? So you'll say yes to being president, right? And I'm like, okay, great, we'll be PTO president. So again, and, I, and through your point, I met a lot of strong connections there. So I think you know, with your faith and taking that course, it helps you. Great. All right, I, there's one uh, question here that I think is going to be a good wrap-up question. We, we need to cut at 728 on the dot, I promise. <laughs> and this is good because we're going to lead into a networking session immediately following. So here's a question that's long, but any of you that want to comment, um, please do. So uh, last fall, I attended the Women's Professional Network talk on the Stiletto Network. And the speaker discussed some of the informal, informal networks that are becoming increasingly important to women in leadership roles. Can you share some thoughts on those informal networks and how they impact women leaders? I think that I've found that through the informal ones, there's that sense of genuineness. Like, I don't mind telling you tonight all the mistakes I've made along the way. I call them stepping stones to success, maybe, instead of failures or mistakes. But I think in those informal ones, you find where women will truly pour out their hearts and souls to you and really give you the path to success that will help you. So some of the informal networks, you know, in my world as a consultant and a woman, it's very difficult to find other women of the same age with children who were facing the same challenges of being gone all the time and managing the soccer game and making it to this play. And so over time, you meet other professionals and, and informally, you know, when I have a problem or I'm not really sure of something, I will call them. And I'll, I'll call a friend of mine who's a PhD in nursing. Hey, Debbie, I need to know what, you know, what is your thought on this and get course corrected. And, and it's a strong enough relationship with this informal group that they'll tell you when 
when you're wrong and they'll tell you when you're right. It's kind of nice to have something other than just your internal compass to fall back on. And also, um, I know we have sort of a fear with like, you know, labels when you hear like, oh, this is CEO of this company or, you know, um, we have Judy Wicks from White Dog Cafe, like those are big names. But then when you really get to meet them informally, we're all just people and, you know, we all share that same, all the same feelings and you can really just get to know people on a one-on-one -on -one level. So I think these informal meetings are great. I also think from informal meetings, um, I always, I came out of school thinking that everybody had this defined career path and I was the only person who didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grow up. Um, I thought everybody kind of shoots up that corporate ladder um, and I think kind of these informal discussions make you realize that not everybody is on this straight shot career path. I think um, a lot of the conversation we've had today really shows how you know we kind of diverted to this and then went to this and it's almost I think um, Sandberg said it best when she said her career path like a jungle gym um, because I honestly think I'm always on a different rung and trying to hang on so um, don't don't think that um, just because we're here we we kind of know where we're going I think that's part of the excitement of, of um, innovation creativity entrepreneurship entrepreneurship it's kind of not knowing where you're going next but knowing that you're kind of going up but you're not sure where or maybe down or up for a while and then back down but you'll be okay you'll get there that was well said <laughs> very entrepreneurs well said. are driven yeah, I definitely <laughs> agree with that statement I thought that was very well said as long as you have that positive mindset of the fact that you're still going up and you know where the next round might, might come from um, and to the informal networking thing I would say I mean I guess it depends on what you would define as informal but here in, in the city and I'm sure in Philly too and I know that a lot of you guys will get out and go to major cities and, and such there are a ton of women's groups girls that get together um, to talk about career and business, some that are doing entrepreneurial things together, and a, a lot of groups that people, for the sole, they get together over drinks and, and stuff for the sole purpose of talking about and, and helping one another network and build out those um, relationships. And they're all online, so that, that's a Google search, you know? So, um, and I would really encourage um, all of you to take advantage of that type of thing. Um, even even in advance of graduating, reach out, try to see what's available um, in the place that you might be going to, and then um, definitely take advantage of it as, as soon as you arrive. All right, great. Well, thank you very much to all of our panelists. Uh, quick round of applause for them.